Good morning, Faith Community Church. Today, we won't be serving the Lord's Supper, so just want to let you know if you want to start preparing for that, now's the time. Church, the Lord has a case against America, probably a case against the whole world, but we live here in America, and God is not first anymore. There's too many that pretend he's first, but their actions, the way they live their lives, their hearts show something different because there's greed, selfishness, pride, self-centeredness. Lord, help us to move all that, not of you, out of the way, to move it out of the way and to make room for you. I find space for what I treasure. Yeah. 
morning to you. Good morning. I, uh, as I hear the words, I will say that if we truly want to make change in America, well then we too must make time for God. If we truly want to see things not go as the status quo, we must, we must make time for God. If you will, open your Bibles to Micah, the sixth chapter. And we will be looking at verses, to start, verses 9 through 16. Listen to the Lord. Listen, the Lord is calling to the city. And to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the Lord, the one who appointed it. I'm still to, to forget your ill-gotten treasures, your wicked house, and sharp ephah, which is accused? Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent. Your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat, but not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You'll store up, but save nothing, because what you save, I will give to the sword. You will plant, but not harvest. You will press olives, but not use of the oil. You will crush grapes, but not drink of the wine. You observe the statues of Omri and all the practice of Ahab's house. You have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruins and your people to a derision. You will bear scorn of all nations. Go with me in prayer, if you will. Father God, I come here this morning humbly, Lord, seeking your face. Lord, that we, as your people, who are called by your name, will humble ourselves Seek forgiveness of your sin, our sins, and Lord, faithfully follow you. I pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. The words that you have heard me read from this passage of words of guilt and impending punishment to the nation of Israel. It is literally God's lawsuit against the nation of Israel. But I want to say to you as you hear these words, I believe that it's God's lawsuit against America. So let me give you some background that we can make this clear. Micah was one of a line of 8th century prophets, the line of Isaiah, the line of Amos, and in the line of Hosea. And his job was one that was very hard, for he was one that he was to bring an unpleasant word to the people. Along chapter 3, he talks about people that were unjust, that 
inequalities, inequalities rather, was the status quo. And he warned the people that God was very concerned about equality and justice. And doing so, he people sometimes may wonder, well, why what is going on? Why is all of this happening? But God wants us to know that he is very much not only concerned about justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness is no doubt who he is. God wants to, us to know that it is who he is for as justice and righteousness. So he tells us in Psalm 89, verse 14, justice, righteousness, and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. So God is telling us justice and righteousness are foundational to his throne, meaning that God is right, justifiable, just, equitable, and fair. And because of this, it's just who he is. It's his DNA as God. And then he says, love and faithfulness go before you, meaning they proceed from God's throne, the work of his will. Everything from God is the foundation of him being almighty, him being the sovereign God. And we as kingdom people, we have to Look at what's said even in Matthew 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we practice that pattern of prayer, we have to know that it is God's will, it is who he is, that we will have justice, that we will maintain, have righteousness here in America. But the killing of George Floyd tore the band-aid off the legacy of unrighteousness and injustice that's been the foundation of this country through slavery. And the church has never really addressed the issue, not holistically. So as a result, God brings his case against the United States of America for not addressing the wrong of racism, injustice, inequalities on all levels. So we see and we have this COVID-19 disease, but we also have the disease of racism that's causing all kinds of problems, but the body of Christ should never have. And I'm here to tell you that as the church goes, so goes the nation. The cure never begins in the White House, the schoolhouse, but the church house. Because God has placed the church as his agent for his kingdom to come. So people ask me, what's wrong? I've never seen things this bad before. Well, why would God do this? But God is telling us no more business as usual. And shockingly, the Lord called for a trial, just as he did in Micah's time. And he calls for Michael to present his case, to present the Lord's case. The courtroom, this is you all, a courtroom setting, and it's like no other lawsuit. The case must be presented. But there's something different about this courtroom because the Lord himself is the people's accuser and judge. And he spoke directly to them. God told Micah to present his case 
in verses 1 through 3. Listen to the Lord, to what the Lord says. Stand up and plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, the Lord accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done? How have I burdened you? Answer me. God goes on in the passage in the following verse to remind them what a good God he's been. He tells them that it was him who brought them out of the bondage of Egypt. It is him that as the death angel was coming by, he to, to mark blood on the household that it would be the Passover. It was him that brought them through the parting of the Red Sea. It was him that gave them leaders like Moses, Aaron, and Mary. It was him. And it was him that delivered them to the promised land. And God did these things. And why did he do it? He states it in verse 5. That you may know the righteousness act, righteous acts of God. And they needed a reminder of God, of how righteous and merciful that he is. And we say all the time that God is good, and all the time God is good. So why do we call his name and we treat him so badly and represent him so poorly and not obey his laws of justice and righteousness. Let me remind you, if you are a child of the living God, it is he who brought us eternal life out of death. It is he who allowed his only begotten son to take us out of the slave of sin. It is he that gives us the power of the Holy Spirit that we don't face the penalty or power of sin. So let me remind you, if a president, a governor, a senator, a U.S. representative, a lawyer, a doctor, a, a parent of a household as a wife, a husband, a treasurer, a financial officer, whatever you may be, an engineer, whatever it is, you are just not God's person you're just not a person, rather, in that position. You are God's person in that position. And he is looking for you and I to represent him well. Let me remind you of the charges against Israel and see if it strikes a chord with us. He tells them again in verses 9 through 12, Listen, the Lord is calling to the city. And the fear, your name is wisdom. Heed the rod of the one who appointed it. Why are we receiving all these things? Why is COVID-19 happening now? Why is George Floyd, why is he erupting not only in this nation for change, but all over the world now for change? And he goes on. And I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, your wicked house, and your short ephah, which is accused? Shall I quit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your, ri your rich people are violent, your inhabitants are liars, and their tongue speaks deceitfully. People and nations do not, that do not meet God's requirement face his judgment. And God says, am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, your wicked house, your sharp ephah, which is treasures? Am I to forget the way you practice 
inequality with wealth in this country. When the accused sells something, the amount was always more than it, what it should be. When the accused buys something, the purchase weighed less than it should. This produced you all a wealthy class and a poor class. The wealthy had uh, used deceitfulness and lies to gain their way, but these practices resulted in violent actions against the poor. The wealthy were stealing their money, homestead, inherent lands, a path to slow death of the nation. And he tells us this then in Micah 6, 13. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. God has begun to show us something through COVID-19, through the sin of racism, and it's beginning to destroy us. And you know, as they were standing back then, standing before the Lord as their judge and accuser, you may think, if that was me, I would repent. One who represented Israel, though, came forth and listened to what he said to the Lord. He said this in verses 6 through 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of oil, olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? The obvious answer to all who truly believe and follow the Lord is no. No person can be forgiven for their sins and become acceptable to the Lord through human effort. It's not religion and rit rituals that make a person acceptable to God. Through centuries up to Michael's day, the Jews had worshiped and practiced rituals of their religion. They went through the motions, religious activities, but their hearts are far from God. Are we just going through the motions of religious activity and our hearts are far from God today? And for 400 years, we have practiced and denied the sin of racism in this country by sin of commission or omission. And those who are guilty are just going through the motions of religious activity, but their hearts are far from God. People live, believe that they can live as they want, coveting, deceiving, lying, cheating, stealing, and engaging in illicit sex. Then they think they can appease God, receive forgiveness by confessing and presenting their offering and sacrifice. They ignorantly believe they can, could violate God's law and still be, still be accepted by him as they long to practice religion rituals. But Micah's question exposed the foolishness of their thinking. Not even most perfect sacrifice, not even the largest amount of offering could please the Lord not when people continue to disobey him. So in saying that, what does the Lord require of us? How can we in this present day of COVID-19, of the sin of racism, what should we do knowing that God has allowed this, being an almighty God, a sovereign God, and we know that just to speak of a word, he ended. What does he then require of us, his people? He says this in Micah 6, 8. 
He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. How can we understand Micah's understanding of what God expects from us? Micah makes it clear that there will be no more business as usual in the religious department without a change of heart and life. A simple reading of the text would only emphasize the need to do social justice and be happy with the providing the provisions of goodness. However, a more nuanced and complex meaning of Michael's words reflect the need for social justice to be done with humility and awareness of the role of God in one's life. Michael contrasts the nature scorekeeping to path to God's path. And he says, he has told you, O model, what is good. The Torah back in that day had already given God's people the path of life. Moreover, Michael stands in the line of prophets who have reminded people over and over of this path. Michael offers a summation of what God requires, at once more simple, more difficult than keeping ritual practice. Do justice to the loving kindness to walk humbly with your God. To enact justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God are not single acts that we can just check off a list and then go on about our business. On an individual and social scale, it's ways larger and larger in our lives. What we see in the United States today is a breakdown and failure to do justice. To act justly, we should treat one another fairly, honestly, and ethically. The biblical concept, however, of justice includes the ordinary restrictions against stealing, cheating, dishonesty, bribery, extortion, adultery, and so on. However, biblically, God's idea is much more. It calls each one of us that are Christian to be actively seeking to do good to one another, to help each other in a time of need. It includes commandments to perfect the welfare of the helpless, the defenseless of society, especially widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. The all Lord also requires his people to seek and practice mercy. This means we should seek to be merciful as God is merciful and act in mercy toward one another. It is a part of God's royal love, a steadfast loving kindness. Loving kindness is a love that seeks to do good to one another. It's a love-based merit. Now, it's love-based, not merit-based. A love that forgives and pardons whether not, not more than what a person rather deserves. The Lord requires further, further that people walk humbly with him. What are we to do as we seek to be merciful and meek with, with, with him? We ought to not be proud or arrogant about our sins. We ought to be humble and a humble estimate of what our abilities and importance are. We ought to be free from vanity, egotism, boastfulness, and pretension. We ought to trust the Lord and acknowledge him as a source of our lives as we walk through daily, day by day, seeking to live for him. 
In addition, we ought to constantly seek mercy and forgiveness. I was reading something that was very interesting about North Carolina. North Carolina is called the Tar Heel State. But they are known for something else. They are known also for the home of the happiest mugshots. You know you get a mugshot when you committed a crime and they take it before the camera and they snap it and that is your mugshot. Well, North Carolina was known for people to be most happy while they were taking it. And they had this Microsoft cognitive service, web-based tool, that would determine the emotion in order to determine the mood of the suspect. And it came out that North Carolinians, no matter what the crime was, whether it was a minor crime, or cruelty of animals, or child abuse, abuse or vandalism, or, or even murder, these people came out dominating more than any of those in the United States. For they would smile, though they would have a crime. Now there's a time to be happy, but not while you're being booked for a crime. Yet, we all are guilty of this in some way, especially while we allow the sin of racism in our country. We smile, and God can be booking us with a mugshot of the crime. Haven't you ever been happy over something that you should have not, you should have been repentant instead? An act of hate, a moment of uh, anger, Thoughts of revenge or ill-gotten gains or the demise of an enemy. It's a heart problem, and we all suffer from it. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So God wants us to be happy, but he also wants us to be happy about the right things. Things like love, mercy, and forgiveness. Don't be known for the happiest mugshot right now. Be known for being happy in the Lord's service doing his will. There's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. This is a time for us to rebuild. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Periodic nods of equality does not constitute a faithful life. Michael tells us several things. We cannot observe racial quotas in society in place of seeking racial justice. We cannot sit on the check and uh, send checks to a disaster relief and avoid examining the lifestyle that contribute, at least in part, to the natural desire. We could not do homework walks and refuse to be charged of our commercialist lifestyle. We could not confess with our lips on Sunday morning and hold grudges on work Monday through Saturday. We could not simply tolerate people that, suck, that are different from us when we are called to love one another. Rather than offer a thousand rams, Michael calls us to offer a thousand daily acts of love for each other and the God that we say we love. We walk humbly with God means that our bent toward self-righteousness, not self-absorbedness. We cannot play church 
and frame our religious life as a game where we keep God in check by performing prescribed duties. The life of the faithful is indeed to reorient our hearts and our life. So how can we be good? How can we do good? The difficulty here lies in assumption that being made in the question, namely that there is such a thing as a good person. Jesus offered this further clarification in the form of a question and answer. He once was asked, good teacher, what, does it, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The theory of the question was clear. Jesus is a good person. Good people inherit eternal life. So what was, must we be do to be part of that group? Jesus simply replied, replied, but it was surprising. Why do you call me good? He asked. He did answer his own question. No one is good except God alone. Truth is that the issue is not about good people not inheriting eternity. Sadly, the problem is much worse. Jesus seemed to define goodness in terms of being like God on that basis. There are no good people anywhere. Thus, the real question is not about who is good enough to get in heaven. The real question is how good God makes it possible for anyone to know and follow and be transformed by an eternal God at all. The answer is that we need God in us, the goodness of God in us. It is God in us that makes a difference. But it can't be by arrogance. It can't be by the business as usual. We must each examine ourselves day by day. Does God goodness, is it in us? Is it transforming us? Why? No one likes to go to court. And further, no one likes to go to court and space God both as our judge and our accuser. He is bringing an indictment against us. The whole world is watching us. And we don't want to be the scorn of the embarrassment of every nation. So what can we do? Israel tried all sorts of excuses and alibis. They pointed to everything that they already were doing. He rejected their plan and called for a simple one. Love justice. Act faithfully and live life according to God's direction. What is your plea when you face God, the judge? You say, the devil made me do it? Or I will give you anything I own. You can't follow the world's way of bribery. You can't even point to your personal suffering or sacrifice. There are many people that will come to, for Jesus and they will say, I prophesied in your name. I did this in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me, you evil person. So I say to you today, confess your sins now. Let God declare your innocence and righteousness. Start meeting God's expectation. Then you can truly say, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Father God, I thank you for these convicting words to all of us today. As we look at what's going on in this nation. I pray, Father, that we examine ourselves. We see the sin, Lord, of racism, 
that's putrefying the body of Christ and now even the nation. I pray, Father, that we are not the scorn of other nations. I pray, Father God, that we hear your words today. Tough word, but nothing's too big for God. I pray, Father, that we follow you. We follow your directions. I pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Tough words today. But we're given a time. As I mentioned in the message today, to be reminded. To be reminded of his goodness as we take our Holy Communion. So go get, if you will, a cup of water, juice, whatever it may be. Get a cracker, a piece of bread. This is a time where we really need to examine our hearts that our heads are right, that we are holding no malice, no hatred, no greed of what so much corrupts our society and our culture. If you will, let this be our time of communion. Let us reflect on the one who have changed our lives from death to life, from an eternity with Satan, now an eternity with God. For one, through the power of the Holy Spirit, now we don't have to face the penalty of sin, of the power of sin. But he has called us to a life, and a life that's more abundant. If you will, take what is bread. Again, it's not the bread on Sunday to be something I'll crack it. And take what is the cup, representative of his blood. The bread, representative of what is his body. Eat, if you will, that which represents his body, the bread. And in the same way, the cup, which represents his blood, drink. That which you now have taken is that of the new covenant, a covenant of Let's walk worthy of the grace of God. Amen. That concludes our service. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you'd like to bless Faith Community Church with your giving, we are on Givelify and PayPal. Have a blessed week, and we will see you next week. Thank you. I find space for what I treasure. I make time for what I want. I choose.